Hello and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and today I'm really looking forward to continuing our conversation about the Detroit Mafia, perhaps the most recommended mafia I've ever received from any of my fans since starting this channel. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to the Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Let's start with a brief recap from our last episode. Detroit essentially had four working pieces. Agostino Pitale from Terracini, Sicily. The Gianola family, also from Terracini, Sicily. Pietro Mirabile from Alcomo, Sicily. And from Salimi, Sicily, only about 35 kilometers from Alcomo. The Caruso brothers, along with their nephew, Vito Adamo. Agostino Vitale was already mobbed up when he came to the United States. He was a winemaker in his legitimate work and had a large family. He grew in his power by exchanging favors in Detroit's Little Sicily and becoming a man of respect. The Janolas were leaders of a black hand gang and were very different from Vitale. Where Vitale relied on influence and favors, the Janola brothers relied on violence. However, Vitale and the Janolas were associates. They just weren't directly working together. Pietro Mirabile was the strongest contender in the beginning of the Terracini vs. El Camo conflict that eventually erupted in the beginning of the 20th century. He was also associated with a Black Hand extortion group. Mirabile was younger than Vitale and moved his operations a lot faster. He worked legitimately in the fruit business, but lacked the man of respect status that Vitale had earned over the course of time. The Caruso brothers, Giuseppe and Calogero, were a bit of a combination of Mirabile and Vitale. Like Vitale, they moved a little slower in their public appearance and completed favors for the less fortunate to earn respect. Unlike Vitale, though, they focused in on produce sales and earned a great deal of influence very quickly, establishing their headquarters at a grocery store. They would soon call their nephew, Vito Adamo, to join them in Detroit. The Carusos and Adamo were not strong enough to go against Vitale alone, so they teamed up with Pietro Mirabile, who became their boss, while Calogero Caruso took on the role of underboss. At this point in Detroit, you have Vitale and the Genolas versus Mirabile and the Carusos. From here, it is widely believed that Mirabile got to Agostino Vitale's cousins, Andrea, Francesco, and Salvatore Vitale. Andrea Vitale had begged Agostino for passage back to Sicily to retrieve his family, but Agostino refused. It seems that Mirabile found this weakness and purchased passage back to the old country for Andrea, in exchange for taking out Agostino Vitale and his associates. Perhaps Andrea recruited his cousins, Salvatore and Francesco, for the job. On November 26, 1907, Andrea Vitale shot Agostino Vitale and two of his associates, resulting in the death of one of them. Agostino survived this attack, barely, and would be forced to step down as boss of Detroit. The next day, on November 27, 1907, Francesco and Salvatore Vitale would attempt to kill Gianola member Salvatore Leone. Unfortunately for the Vitales, they were caught red-handed by law enforcement, and Leone survived the attack. Andrea Vitale was captured the night of the attack on his cousin, and would later be tried for murder. He would attempt to plead insanity, but it didn't work, and he was given life in prison. This left Pietro Mirabile in charge of Detroit, but that did not mean he was without enemies. After Vitale was taken out, the Janolas began giving Mirabile problems by way of their Black Hand extortion group, specifically in the area of Wyandotte. Vito Adamo of the Carusos, would break off on his own, although would still rely heavily on Mirabile. Adamo's faction really became the primary rival against the Genolas when he created the White Hand Society Countergroup. 1912 to 1913 would mark a year of serious turf war in Wyandotte between the White and Black Handers. Adamo's reign would end when he and his brother were fatally shot on their way home from a meeting with Mirabile on November 24, 1913. The White Handers, with the help of Mirabile, and the Carusos would continue the fight against the Genolas for a short while but were ultimately unsuccessful. The Genolas quickly pushed Mirabile out of headship. He was outed as a mafia boss and then returned to Sicily. After that, the Genolas became the bosses of Detroit, with Tony Genola as the boss and Salvatore Genola as the underboss. And that's where we're going to pick up the story today. If the details are still a little fuzzy for you, please make sure to watch last week's episode to catch up and get back on track. But for right now, let's keep moving forward. Tony Janola becomes boss of Detroit at the end of 1913. By the way, that is the same year that Jimmy Hoffa was born in Brazil, Indiana. Much like the Purple Gang, I will have to put Jimmy Hoffa on the back burner until I can cover him in his own episode. There's just too much crime in Detroit for me to cover it all at once. Janola really came into his own in 1914 and would control the city without much contest. In addition to Janola, the man who would become his lieutenant or capo, Pietro Bosco, would rise in his station as well. Bosco had worked with Janola despite being from Castellamare de Orfo. He was a baker and grocery store owner for his legitimate work, 
and a trusted partner of Janola in the realm of the illegal. With the rise of Janola, Bosco was able to earn enough money to open a second grocery store, as well as a meat distributorship and car garage. He was considered the most lethal capo in the Janola gang. Perhaps that's why he was the Janola favorite. Bosco, with the help of his lieutenant John Vitale, no relation to Agostino Vitale, would be responsible for the string of murders including the police detective Emmanuel Rogers. Rogers had recently arrested several Janola mafiosi in 1917 for their car theft operation, much of which was ran under Bosco. Detective Rogers was murdered on July 24, 1917. No one was ever charged for the crime. Bosco was among Detroit's richest, and it's believed that aside from the Janolas themselves, Bosco was the richest mafiosi in the city. The friendship between Tony Janola and Pietro Bosco was a ticking time bomb, however. While healthy suspicion and mistrust did a Detroit mobster well, sometimes it costs him dearly. In addition to being a great asset to the Janolas himself, Bosco helped bridge the gap with other Sicilian mobsters not from Terracini, and of course, the most bloodthirsty of those gangsters found work with Bosco. That didn't matter to Tony Janola. Bosco was making too much money and gaining too much power, and soon he was suspected of going against the family. Janola and Bosco were at odds with one another. Eventually the men parted ways and split the family. This severely punctured the Janola power, and further division set in when Pietro Bosco was murdered on October 8, 1918, on Janola orders. Some sources maintain that Janola was right to suspect Bosco as he, with the silent assistance of John Vitale, had been coordinating a takeover. In any case, this murder tore the family apart, and would start the bosco Janola War that lasted almost exactly a year. On January 3rd, 1919, Tony Janola would be visiting the family of one of his recently murdered men to comfort them. His visit would wind up giving the exact opposite of comfort to the family. As he approached the home, a mysterious gunman arose from the shadows and unloaded his gun into Janola's head and body. It is the general consensus that Bosco loyalists, now under the leadership of John Vitale, took Janola out. After Tony Janola's death, his brother Salvatore Janola took on Detroit leadership. He had been the Janola family's top enforcer and was believed to be the leader of the Janola muscle that made sure there was no competition in the city for either other mafia control or control of the produce monopoly that they had established. In February of 1919, Salvatore Janola was almost killed by a drive-by shooting that took the life of his brother-in-law. While at his brother-in-law's funeral, Janola had ordered that John Vitale's grocery store be shot up in retaliation. John Vitale would then be arrested after officers came to investigate the shooting and Vitale, believing that they were more Janola men, opened fire. While in jail, Vitale arranged for three visitors to come and see him on February 26, 1919. Vito Renda, Salvatore Bola, and his teenage son, Giuseppe Vitale. As these three visitors arrived at the jail, two Janola men opened fire on them. Renda received over 20 gunshot wounds. Before he died, he accused Sam Janola as being the shooter. Giuseppe Vitale and Salvatore Vola survived the attack. Despite appearances, after Tony's death, Salvatore Janola was in the process of trying to get out of the city. It is reported that it was too hot for him in Detroit, and his intention was to open a macaroni factory in Cincinnati, Ohio. The fresh start for the Janolas that never materialized. On October 2, 1919, Salvatore Janola was exiting the bank after cashing a $200 check. As he left, gunmen opened fire, filling his body with over 24 gunshot wounds. He was able to get back into the safety of the bank, but would die from his injuries. Sam Janola would be boss for less than a year, and then John Vitale would take over Detroit and be boss for, well, less than a year himself. As I've mentioned already, Detroit was filled with budding mafia and organized crime families, especially when prohibition was passed in the year of 1919 to be put into effect in 1920. Detroit sits right on the Canadian border, and Canada did not pass any such restrictive prohibition law against alcohol. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Opportunistic mobsters saw this as an opportunity to import illegal booze and make a fortune, and other mobsters were cramming into the city to take advantage of the same opportunity. John Vitale could not have chosen a more prosperous time to become boss, but it was also the most contentious. The East Siders of Detroit, made up mostly of remaining Janola loyalists as well as new recruits enthusiastic about making prohibition money, were rising up against John Vitale. Vitale would quickly prove to be a worse leader than Janola in this. He was a coward. It made the loyalty that the Janolas had experienced impossible to find. Vitale, terrified to face the wrath of the Janola loyalists, was reported to have refused to leave his home. Vitale ordered his gunmen to take out Giuseppe Manzello, a man who had risen up as an East Side leader, in the summer of 1920. The hit on Manzello was successful, in that the man was killed, 
but tactically unsuccessful as it caused the exact opposite reaction for which Vitale had hoped. Manzello's murder had about the same effect on the East Siders in 1920 that the British forces Boston Massacre had on the colonial rebels in 1770. It did not deter them, it inspired them. Because of this hit on Manzello and several other hits that had taken place under John Vitale, he earned the nickname of Bloody John. Despite how cowardly it appeared, Vitale was not misguided in his fear of leaving his home. On August 18, 1920, Vitale and his son Giuseppe Vitale, the same son who had been injured while visiting Vitale in jail, would be fired upon. Giuseppe had come to pick up his father. As Vitale was walking out to the vehicle, snipers from across the street opened fire. Giuseppe Vitale was shot and killed. Upon witnessing the death of her son, Vitale's wife ran screaming past the rain of bullets to grab her son's body and drag him into the house. Vitale himself would be wounded, but survived the attack by ducking behind the car. The next month, on September 28, 1920, John Vitale would be murdered. Although his murder remains unsolved, it appears that the lack of loyalty that he had been accumulating was what ended up being his undoing. Most theorize that since Vitale never went anywhere without his bodyguards, that this was a setup. Many suspect that his top bodyguard, Andre Licato, who was the lead suspect in the murder of Detective Rogers, may have been the murderer. Licato himself would die by gunshot by mid-October. With Vitale dead, many of the factions within Detroit found it easier and easier to work together. The discussion about who was boss during the early Prohibition era is hotly contested and likely without a clear answer. Angelo Melli is considered by many to have been one of the most powerful East Siders left, and thus, the de facto Detroit boss. This leadership would last only as long as he was the most powerful. Melly, it seems, was not particularly interested in being the Detroit boss. He was more focused on lucrative bootlegging rackets. Along with his partners, Melly got to work creating a framework for what became the modern partnership. Melly collaborated with many important mafiosi, including Chester Lamare, a non-Sicilian involved in West and North Detroit's protection, bootlegging, narcotics, smuggling, and gambling operations, Guglielmo Tocco and Joseph Zerilli, friends and brothers-in-law and East Side leaders, Salvatore Catalanotto, originally part of the Mirabile gang, who came alongside the more peaceful Prohibition coalition being pieced together, John Priziola, who became known as Papa John and served as consigliere and briefly as acting boss later on, Peter Licavoli, originally from Tucson, who would go on to be an extremely active decision maker for the coalition. All of these huge names in the Detroit Partnership will be the subject of the next episode. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews continuing our conversation about the Detroit Mafia. I know many of you are probably very eager to learn more in our next episode, but I hope that this episode provided you with more insight into the Detroit Mafia and helps you to understand all of the framework that had to be laid before Detroit's golden era. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about the Detroit Mafia. Also, don't forget to utilize that comment section in social media to let me know who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao!